Thank you for coming. I get really excited about sharks, so I hope that if I'm going crazy, don't worry about me. Um, so this is just a little bit about me. Right now, I'm finishing up my graduate program at Miami University, which is really a, it's an amazing program. Um, and just a little bit about that, once a month I fly to Cincinnati, Ohio, because my cooperating zoo is the Cincinnati Zoo. So I go to Cincinnati, I take an all day long course at the zoo, and then there's lots of online work to be done as well. Um, so it's a very, very amazing program. It's called Project Dragonfly, and this Project Dragonfly encompasses the entire globe. So they have a program called the Global Field Studies, where students come um, they do online things because they do four weeks like in Africa, or four weeks in Thailand, or four weeks in Belize. So it's a program that is all about preserving nature and conservation in our, in our world. That's, I, I cannot even begin to tell you the amazing people that I have met through this program. Um, my cooperating zoo is the Cincinnati Zoo, and of course that's in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, it's a really fabulous zoo. They just had another little baby hippo born, which I will be able to see. Next Saturday when I go to the zoo, his name is Fritz, and um, he's an adorable little, I've seen the pictures, and he's adorable, so I can't wait to see him in person. But the Cincinnati Zoo also does major conservation work all over the world. And then, this is the Brunswick High School Dragon, so I am a Brunswick High School teacher. In 2020, I started the program, and of course that was the very, very beginning of COVID. And so, as part of this program, you're, it's all about inquiry coming up with something that you want to study and you ask a question and then you think, well, what, what do I want to know? So I, I had, as a teacher, I had used the data from OSEARCH to teach my students about how to track sharks and, and I was really, really interested in that. And I needed to come up with a research question. So I'm brand new to the program, stuck at home, nobody's doing anything, what can I do to learn more about sharks? How can I use this app? So I started looking at all of the data from OSEARCH and I settled on five sharks that had four or more years of, of data. So what OSEARCH does, I'm going to go back for a second, they, they tag white sharks and they put this spot tag on top of them. So every time the dorsal fin rises above the surface of the water, it connects to a satellite and it takes time stamps of where that shark is in, in the ocean so that then you can see what they're doing online. So I looked at five different sharks over a course of five years of data. This is Jeannie's track. And so over five years, I'm just going to kind of go around here. So the different colors are the different years. And you can see that she really didn't go north of Cape Cod, spent a lot of time around Cape Cod, went out here a little bit, spent a little time in this area. And this is kind of over the years, she just kind of stayed in that particular area. So I was starting to look at migration patterns of white sharks as my kind of inquiry. Then I looked at Catherine's trap, and you can see Catherine did a lot of crazy stuff. So the purple was one year, so she went out here all the way out to the continental shelf, and then she had some time where she was spinning around all the way up here in Newfoundland. And then you see that even at the time in, 19, uh, in 2014, she's in the Gulf of Mexico, but that's the only time she went there. This is the only time she went here. So she has some very interesting data. Um, and so it was, it was kind of cool to look at how different sharks were using the water. up in the Labrador Sea in January. And that's where this white shark was. So all the way up here, out here in, in the cold, 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 but then at other times she'd be down here on the coast of Florida, or Georgia, or South Carolina. And it was not always the same every single year, going different places, just really unusual kinds of things. This is Miss Costa. search what they do is, this is from the Costa Sunglasses Company. So they contributed some money and they got to name the shark for them, this pasta. So again, you can see right here, and again, she's not going really past Cape Cod. And you can see the different colors of what she's doing with her migration from year to year.
She's like the queen of the white sharks in terms of OSERT. And you can see again all the different places, which put a lot of condemnation down in this area. And then sometimes out here. So Mary Lee provided scientists with a lot of information about the movement of white sharks. So when I was doing this, I plotted, I took, you know, use Google Earth, plotted the areas, labeled them all, et cetera, et cetera, so that I could see how much time they were spending here, here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, how much time the sharks in the course of their migration were spending in those places. The following year, I looked specifically at data related to the Gulf of Maine. So here we are, here we are in the Gulf of Maine. The sharks, the, the tags that are bright yellow are sharks that were tagged off of the coast of Cape Cod. The tags that are green are the sharks that were actually tagged off of the coast of Nova Scotia. So for years and years and years, people thought sharks didn't like cold water, that they wouldn't be anywhere, that they would be, you know, out. And they'd go to Cape Cod, and they'd go back to the Gulf of Mexico, and then they come up to Cape Cod, and they go back to the Gulf of Mexico. So what the data, the data is showing us, which is really, really interesting, is that sharks that are tagged here kind of go back there year after year. Sharks that are tagged here kind of go this area year after year. They have pretty strict site fidelity, that they're going back and forth. But what's really cool, they're not usually hanging out here. They're using the Gulf of, Mex of, of Maine as a highway. So they're going from the south, and then they're making their way up through here, and then they're hanging out here. If they're tagged at Cape Cod, they're really pretty not going north. They're kind of hanging out down here. So what this, yeah, what this data is telling us is that we don't have a ton to worry about. As mayors, we don't have a lot to worry about. I know we had a fatality two years ago. I know that there is concern, which I'm going to talk about. But this Gulf of Maine, is simply a place where they're moving through. They're going from the south up here to where there's much more, um, more seal congregations than there are in Maine. Yes, we have a lot of seals, but it's not where the seals are hanging out on islands. So it's a little different. This is where we are, and sharks are just, it's, it's, the data is showing us that they're using this as a highway, and they're not hanging out here, living here, making their living off of the seals here in Maine. This is a picture that I took on my iPad this, this afternoon. So this is today. This is the Gulf of Maine. These are where sharks, tag sharks are pinged. So they've come up, their tags have pinged. I noticed what's really cool is that they're right, they're in north, they're in cold water. It's starting to get cold up there now, but they're hanging out there. A couple are still off of Cape Cod. But we're looking at the Gulf of Maine here. We're not thinking of them. They're not spending a ton of time in the Gulf of Maine. So that's today. Um, this is just a little cartoon. So we have two white sharks talking, and they, you know, the whole Facebook thing where you get tagged in a photo. Oh yeah, I remember I was tagged. And this is exactly what the scientists do. They they have a long line. They catch the shark. They put it on the deck of a boat. They lift up the deck. There's actually 16 to 25 scientists working within a 15-minute period. They take all kinds of things like blood, and they do an ultrasound. They're doing all kinds of things, and then they're, they're putting this spot tag on the dorsal fin. And it's actually screwed in through the dorsal fin, and it stays there until it runs out, you know, a good seven, eight years. It's there. It doesn't harm the shark to do that. And they're very, very careful when they bring that shark up. So it's pretty fun to see that this cartoon kind of talks about that. So we know evolutionary records that sharks have been around for 450 million years. They were here before most everything else was. They've survived four mass extinctions. Sharks are still here. White sharks have been around for 14 million years. So the data says that they've been here for 14 million years. They were here 13.6 million years before human beings ever were on the earth. They have been here for a really, really long time. What's really sad is they've been here for a long time, 
and over the past 150 years, we decimated their population. So during that 150 years, people were hunting them for their trophies, put them, you know, hang them up, put their pictures up, you know, hang their, get their bodies stuck. There's a lot of young sharks that are picked off by fishing bycatch. So they're caught in nets where they're not supposed to be, and then they are, they just die from suffocation because white sharks are a species that constantly has to be in motion. They constantly have to have water over their gills. So if they get caught in a net, their water's not moving over their gills, they're going to die. Finning is also what happens to a lot of sharks. The, there are some cultures where they have shark fin soup, and then a white shark fin is even more valuable to cut a white shark fin off and use that for fin, um, shark fin soup. And so a lot of sharks um, have succumbed to that practice. The Jaws effect, 1975, the movie Jaws came out, and people were hurt, terrified. We were just talking about that. My husband took me there on my very first date to see Jaws because he thought it would be fun, you know, on your first date where your date is like really afraid and everything else. So the Jaws effect really scared a lot of people. And people just imagine what it would be like to be chomped by a shark just like on the movie Jaws that people were chomped. And it's a terrifying thing. They are currently vulnerable on the red list of endangered species. They're even more endangered in the Atlantic Ocean. There are seven spots around the globe where white sharks are. They're mostly endangered, more endangered in the, the Atlantic Ocean than they are in other places in the world. So it's pretty interesting that in 150 years, we could take this species that has been around for ages, for millions and millions and millions of years, and pretty much decimate their population. So we're going to talk for a second about seals in Maine. About the mid-1800s, seals were such a nuisance that people started to put a bounty on them. So we put this, you know, money on the seal pelt because the fishermen didn't like them, they were hurting their catches. And the population of seals dropped to between 2,000 and 3,000 in the early 1970s. In 1972, the federal government passed the Marine Protection, new Marine Mammal Protection Act, and it allows the seals population to rebound. Right now, we're saying that there's approximately 40 to 50,000 seals, where there used to be two to 3,000. So now we've got food again for the sharks. So they're coming back. The thing to remember about white sharks, though, is white sharks are very, very slow to mature and grow. They're born six feet in length. When they're first born, they eat primarily fish and squid. So their hunting mannerisms are very, very different. So when they're young, they would swim in along the sand. They're chasing a, a squid. They're chasing a fish. Sometimes they mistake and, and bite a human being down in the south, like in Florida. Um, but the early ages of them, they're eating primarily fish and squid, and they're hunting in shallower water. They're, when they're first little, they're ectotherms, which means they stay in warmer water because they can't regulate their body temperature. The water is what's regulating them for, regulating their body for them. When they get to be between 12 feet and 16 feet in length, their whole entire physiology changes. Their mouth and jaw structure changes because now their diet's going to be mammals. So the whole way that their jaws are structured and the way that their teeth actually point in is very, very different than when they were catching fish. So the diet now includes large mammals. We had some pictures, a video, I think right off of the coast here, where there was a seal, people were out on the boat, they actually captured on video the white shark eating the seal. And there was off the coast of Portland, where the white shark was eating one of the young dolphins down there. So they don't start to do that till they're about 12 feet long. Up until that time, they're eating fish. When they get to be 12 to 16 feet, again, body totally completely changes, and now they are homeotherms. They can maintain their own body temperature, which means that they can stay in cold water. They don't have to be in warm water. So the idea that global warming is causing the sharks to come further north is not, it's not true. 
they are big enough now, they can keep their own body heat, which means that they can stay north waters from colder water. And that's a kind of an interesting thing. White sharks don't start to reproduce until they're these ages. Males are 27 years old before they're considered sexually mature. Females, 33 years old before they're sexually mature. And they incubate the females, carry those babies, for up to 16 to 18 months, which is a long time. I know nine months was tough. So 16 to 18 months to carry a six foot long thing inside of you is kind of why the females are so much bigger than the males. And so they have very small numbers of babies. They're not popping out 200 babies. They're popping out three, maybe four at the most. Then those babies can be easily picked off by other sharks. Those babies can be picked off by um, fishing nets where they die because they suffocate. So it takes a really long time for the shark population to start to rebound. So we have 1972, the seal population starts to rebound. So we're looking now at a good 30 plus years where we're starting to see more sharks. And we're starting to see that the sharks have rebounded because the seals have started to rebound. So you have all of these seals, now we have an apex predator coming, and that apex predator can work and, and take care of the sick animals and take care of or, or reducing the, the population there. So a little bit on just, you know, we're all mainers, we like to be in the water, I like to be in the water, I like to look at the water. So there's lots and lots and lots of misinformation. Um, the other day I was on a, a phone conference with the main white shark working group, which consists of four scientists. It consists of safety officers from up and down the coast of Maine who want to keep their beach goers safe. And so they were kind of talking about what they're seeing. There's so much misinformation. Everybody sees a fin or even a seal head pop up. Ah, there's a shark in the water, there's a shark in the water. So this is gonna help you a little bit to identify when you really need to be ah, there's a shark in the water and oh, isn't that cool? So a white shark has a dorsal fin that kind of is pointed. So we look at this right here, and we see that it has this kind of pointed thing. And we see that it has rough edges right here. This kind of serrated edge is a way that scientists identify individual white sharks, because this is unique to every single white shark. So this whole kind of serration that's there is unique. And you see this, you, know, you can see pictures of white sharks, you can see that they're all a little bit different with the number of notches that they have. So if you see this fin, you're going to think, I probably should get out of the water. This fin is similar in size, but very, very different in structure. This is a basking shark fin. So the basking shark fin is very rounded here and very smooth along this edge. Basking sharks are huge. They can be 16 to 20 feet. But basking sharks are plankton eaters. They have no teeth. They're like baleen whales. So they have this big gaping mouth, they open it up, the waters come through, they collect all of the phytoplankton that's there, and that's how they survive. That's what they eat. They're, when people see this though, okay, fear comes into their mind, and so they start to say, ah, but this shark, if, if it whacks you, you're probably gonna get hurt, but it's not gonna eat you. So, it has a smooth side over there, and then you can see right here, it's got really long, large gills that kind of wrap around their body, and this big gaping mouth. This is a ocean clipfish, also called a mola mola. These, they say they've seen a ton of them in summer. And the way that these fish are, they're so like weird looking. Their fins flop like this as they swim. It's part of their swimming motion. So if you see this really kind of tall, sail-like fin, and it's flapping back and forth, that's a mola mola. Tiny little mouth, each jellyfish. So it's very slow moving, but it's really, really interesting to look at this. It's just one of those, like, how did that happen? How did this unusual fish get to be here? So that's a mola mola, and there are a lot of them, a lot of them off the coast of Maine. Thank you.
You can see more of their top part, their dorsal side of their body as they rise up in the water. And so again, they're, they're beautiful to look at, they're fun to look at, they like to follow fishing boats or whale watching boats. They're cool looking animals and they've also been victims of white sharks. So one of the things that we're not really worried about this time of year because very few people are out swimming unless you're a surfer, um, is see something, say something. So just like we always say in the airports, when you're going through the airport, if you see something, make sure you say something. This is one of the issues that the safety officers are having, where people think they see and then they don't report it for a day or two. Well, it doesn't help anybody if you don't report it for a day or two, because that shark's long gone. Again, the white sharks have to keep swimming, constantly swimming. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say. So the, the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy has this app, app called a called the Sharktivity app. You can put it on your iPhone or your Android. And it constantly will ping when there's been a shark sighting. And so this is kind of what it looks like. This is the entire year of 2022 on the Sharktivity app, along the coast of Maine. The blue ones, the blue little shark fins here, are confirmed sightings of a white shark. The orange ones are things that people think they are a white shark. It's unconfirmed. They also use this right here, these blue ones, to identify where they see a, a injured seal or they see a seal carcass that has a bite out of it that they can say comes from a white shark. But they are, these are kind of the, the notifications that you get. Unfortunately for these, they're mostly not real time. So in Cape Cod, they're so much more aware of what's going on because they have so many more sharks in, around Cape Cod. And so this is constantly motion, you know, people look at the shark, okay, I know that the National Beach now has a shark right off the coast. I want to probably stay waist deep in the water. Maine doesn't have such a, a good kind of real time um, notification system. There are two real time buoys in Maine. Only one of them functions for most of the summer. So that doesn't help anybody either. And the problem with real time buoys is that the shark actually has to have a tag on it. So the real time buoy doesn't recognize if a shark goes by if that shark doesn't have a tag on it. So it's not a ton of help to people, people in Maine, you know, in terms of, oh yeah, I just saw that. Um, the University of New England has a live buoy down in Saco Bay. They got their first tag pin two days ago. So we go all summer long, we have an acoustic buoy out there, recognizes nothing. So the Maine Department of Marine Resources is reporting that they had 38 white shark sightings. Of those 38, they were 14 of them were actual physical sightings. Nine were predation events, like a bite out of a seal or something else. And so this data that they're putting and all of the reports that the beach people were, the safety officers are saying, is indicating that we really don't have a shark problem. That we're aware that we're doing everything we can here in Maine to make sure that bathers and surfers and boaters are safe, but we, we don't have the issue that Cape Cod has. It's kind of interesting. The state of Maine also has this app that they run. Again, this is a little bit more difficult. The shark guy at Maine, he gets the picture, he gets the notification, and he, it takes him a couple of days to actually look at it to say, oh yeah, that was a white shark. So it's not as effective as a real-time release system would be. sharks, apex predators in these waters. So what they found, the lifeguards found, that by doing that, they didn't have to call people in from 400 yards out. You know, people were swimming out really, really far, and that, that, that you know, that were in, they were in the danger zone. So now people recognize that they are in the water, potentially with an apex predator that could eat them. And so they say, you know, these are some things to be aware of in terms of keeping safe. Don't swim alone. We've heard that since we were like three. 
Avoid excessive splashing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Don't swim near seals. Seals are the primary prey for white sharks. Don't swim near fishermen because you'll see lots and lots of times those fish come in on the reel and then the shark comes up and grabs it. So don't swim near where people are fishing. Stay close to shore or to help. Um, don't wear shiny things. Don't swim at dawn or dusk because it's, the waters are murkier. The, sh the sharks can't differentiate between a seal and you. And be careful near drop-offs and sandbars. White sharks that are adult white sharks are different than juveniles. White sharks that are adults like to come from the bottom. And they swim up and they strike their prey with the hope of injuring them enough to keep incapacitate them. And then they'll swim around a little bit and then they'll come back. If sharks wanted to eat human beings, they would. They don't. All the shark attacks that you hear about, they are, they are kind of bitten and then the shark disappears. They don't come back around to eat or munch on that person again. So the sharks really don't, if they wanted to eat us, they would because we swim enough in the ocean. We're out sharing their environment with them. So one of the things to be concerned about here in Maine is that if you're out deep, those big, big sharks are not, you're not gonna see that fin coming. It's not like the movies. Here, we have a very deep drop off and they come from the bottom, they swim up, they attack with such force to incapacitate their prey and then they, they come back. So the person that was injured and died in Hartswell, that's exactly what happened. The shark came up from behind, from the below, struck her, lifted her in the air, caused enough bleeding damage that she bled out before she could get in and get help. So that's one of those things, if you're closer to shore, there are a better chance of getting help and getting to stop the bleeding that occurred there. So juvenile sharks hunt differently than adult sharks, and adult sharks are hunting and coming from the bottom and up. Sharks are colorblind. They don't have great vision. So this is what you and I look like to them when we're swimming. This is their prey. So they're not noticing if you're in pink, purple, or polka dots. That doesn't matter to them because they can't see color. They simply see an outline against the sun coming down and your body prevents the sunlight from going down to them. And they say, oh, that looks, looks like a seal to me. That's lunch. And so they would come up and strike from behind or from underneath. So this is where you can see why people get mistaken for sharks. Because the silhouette is very, very similar to the silhouette of their primary food source. If I put a dolphin silhouette up here, it would also be very similar to a surfboard. So the shark sees the silhouette, comes up from underneath, and decides it looks like it could be something I could eat. Almost all cases of shark attacks are because of mistaken identity. They just can't differentiate between this and that. So one of the things that scientists are working right, on right now is patterning the bottom of, of um, surfboards and patterning wetsuits. So big white stripes and big black stripes instead of just solid black and solid dark right here. Because they think that if they can differentiate the pattern, there's less of a chance that the shark can say, oh, I think that's dinner. So that's something that scientists are working on right now, is changing the patterning of the wetsuits and the surfboard. And they thought, well, maybe if we made it bright pink, it would be different. But what they, they understood then is that sharks are colorblind and they can't tell that it's bright pink. So that makes sense in terms of patterning. Again, shark attacks are really, really, really rare. From this time, 2015 to 2019, water-related fatalities in the United States. 3,231 for boating, 739 for drowning, and just three for shark attacks. So it's very, very rare. Far more likely to die from a boating accident, from a drowning accident, from a shark attack, Last year, 179 people in the United States died because they were trying to take a selfie. <laughs> and they were leaning over, taking a selfie, and then they fell into a giant crevice. So 
the, the thing about this is that it's really, really rare. Yes, we're all, I don't want to be eaten by a shark. It's kind of scary to think about, you know, the chomping and the whole nine yards when you think about the Jaws movie. But it's really, really rare. But it's really a cause for celebration that the sharks are back. We really decimated their population. We really harmed them in tremendous ways. But now, what? Having more apex predators scientifically indicates that you're going to have a healthy ecosystem. If you have apex predators, then other things can survive. So it increases the biodiversity of everything in your ecosystem by having an apex predator. It just, it, it's, you know, that whole, that whole uh, keystone species being there is really important to all the other species. It increases the biodiversity, it removes weak, weak, weak sick and aging animals from the population so that that keeps that population healthy. So if I have weak and sick seals, then the sharks can you know, remove them from their population and then help the, the healthier animals to survive. And then it increases numbers at all levels of that food chain. So it's a really good thing that we have the apex predators coming back. Residency, like tribes of white sharks, similar to like how we see orcas around the, the world. What 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 they're thinking right now is the topography of the, the water off the coast of Maine isn't conducive to that. Okay. So they think that because our type, you know, under the water here, yeah. it's not conducive to what we're seeing in Cape Cod or up in Atlantic Canada. What they think though, and what they're concerned about is um, New York, New York, off the coast of New York, New Jersey, it's called the New York Bite. And they know that that's a white shark nursery. They know that that's where the baby sharks are. And they know that they're there for about one to two years. What they're worried about is that that area of juveniles is gonna move to around the Cape. The area of the adults around the Cape are gonna move to Canada. And so it's gonna push things further north but if they push the babies out of their protected area in that New York bite, they're gonna be much more susceptible to be eaten by larger white sharks and other kinds of predators. And that that could, again, reduce the population of white sharks. So it's kind of, they, I don't think that they're concerned about the whole, you know, we're gonna have all these islands of seals and, and attract them. Our topography isn't like that. Yeah, it's not a nice scene. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah. right. And what's interesting too is if you think, you know, we're, we're Mainers and we know our water is very turbid. You can't put a drone up and look down in the water and say, oh, there's a shark. In Cape Cod, you can. On a clear day, you can put a drone up and you can identify where the sharks are and that's exactly what they're, they're doing in Cape Cod. They're putting planes up in the air to identify where the sharks are and they're using that app, that Sharktivity app, to say, here's where the shark, this is exactly where it is right now, I know where it is. In Maine, we don't have that. We have water that's not nearly as clear as it is in the Cape. It's much deeper than it is at the Cape, so we can't identify where the sharks are. And that's why actually the state of Maine stopped trying to catch them and tag them, because they couldn't find them to tag them. So they're spending a lot of money to send boats out to try and find the white sharks, and it was just wasn't financially conducive to do that. So. Makes sense. Yeah. So are shark numbers not really going up around Cape Cod? I mean, that's always been a congregating point because there's been so much news about it in the last few years, but it's really... The, uh, the numbers are, are finally increasing, like I said. Because, because of the overall right. increase. The overall increase is, is coming back, absolutely. But, you know, you can have 50 seal pups worn at the same time it takes to have three white shark pups for it. So it's, it's a long, it's going to be a long haul to where we see a tremendous increase in the population of white sharks. It's just not, you know, it's just not how it works. Right. So 
Um, this, this summer, I don't know if you're aware, but this summer, the avian flu affects the seal population. So baby seals get sick from the avian flu. And so what they, they, they saw happening, um, Linda Daddy, who is the director of the marine, the Maine Marine Mammal um, Place down in Brunswick, where they take in the injured seals and they rehabilitate them. What they have found there is that these, the baby seals have been affected by the avian flu, and then they're weakened and they become bitter. And that's where they're seeing those shark bites or those injured shark coming. It's not the big seals. It's the babies that they know that, that have been weakened by the avian flu. So it's not the adult seals aren't really affected by that avian flu. It's just the, the young seals that are on. Exactly. <laughs> Which is why this is kind of, it really is kind of like a baby in infancy. The seal is in infancy. You know, the, the white, the tagging of white sharks didn't start happening until 2012. And so that's just 10 years ago. So this is what we know in 10 years of time. That was when the first white sharks were tagged. Yeah. Wow. That's right. In 2012. So we're just dipping our toe in the, the research water right now. And is there funding there for that yet, or just people? Like it's a lot of it is. There's not a tremendous amount of government funding. The funding is coming from private donors. So um, I know right now the Canadians are starting to get worried, right? Because they're reading my research, their research. All of a sudden, like, oh wow, we have a lot of white sharks here. Oh, we don't have a program, or well, we don't know what we're doing. So Dr. Hussey is up in, in uh, Nova Scotia, and he's starting a program there to kind of look at what the white sharks are doing in, in Atlantic Canada. Um, you know, OSEARCH, again, is in their, their 10th year of decade of research. On the West Coast, in the Pacific Ocean, California State University at Long Beach has a program that's amazing. And what they're doing is very, very different because the sharks there behave very differently than the sharks here. They're, they're primarily sea eaters. You know, they have those, and, and what's really, really cool is if you go onto YouTube and you look at California surfer and whatever, people are surfing, and they're just sharks all swimming underneath them. And nobody's worried. They're all just, you know, because the sharks there and that sandy beach, they're eating the skates, they're not eating the people. And People go, the kids, the kids go to surf camp, and <laughs> they surfing with the sharks there. Um, it's very, very interesting that every place in the world where we have a conglomeration of sharks, white sharks, their behavior is specific to that area. The way they hunt is specific to that area. So it's really, you know, it's very, very interesting when you look at their hunting behavior around the world. You, know, you can see a lot of differences like in South Africa because they've got huge waves and it's very different than it is here. Um, one of the other things that I, so you'll see, I know that you've all seen those pictures where the white shark is, is kind of reaching and it's grabbing onto the seal and he, that happens, that area happened in an area off the coast of California. That's not happening anymore. Chris Fallow was the photographer and he can't find that anymore. What they have discovered is that killer whales are killing white sharks for their livers. So they attack the white sharks in that area. They just ram them enough to kill them, to take the liver out, and they leave the rest of the body there. And nobody knows why the killer whales are doing that. But the white sharks then have moved out of that area, and you don't see that breaching anymore because they're not there anymore that they have moved because of the attacking of the orcas. So it's very interesting. 
workers do that with skates down in New Zealand too. They'll go for the skate livers because I think they have a toxic, some kind of chemical in there that gets some um, psychoactive results. From interesting. Uh, That's really interesting. <laughs> cool. Have you heard anything about orcas in down east Maine? I heard of one. And I think that that's going to be a fascinating thing. And are they going to come here? And how are they going to get? Like I'm, I'm looking at the map of the world and thinking, okay, this is where they're kind of located. How are they going to get here? Are they going this way? Or are they going that way? Is there any professional that's on that? Because the reports I've heard have just been from local fishermen. Local fishermen. Not that they're not professional, but just um, somebody that's actually studying. And, and it's interesting because um, Matt Davis, who is the main Department of Marine Resources fish guy, he has a lot of things to say, like there's a lot of conversation that can't be verified. And so they, you know, they need photographic <coughs> evidence, they need a whole bunch of other things to say, okay, now we've got this. Um, when I was doing this down in Kennebunk, a person showed me a picture of a great hammerhead shark. And so I said, you know, Matt, have you heard about hammerheads coming? Because the hammerheads are definitely warm water sharks. And I said, have you heard about hammerheads coming up to Maine? And he said, no. He has, I mean, and he's, he's got his ear to all the fishermen, to everything. So he was thinking that it was almost like somebody had taken a picture from like someplace else and tried to say that, oh, yeah, that was off the coast of Maine. Um, that it wasn't there, you know, I don't know how you verify that. Oh, this is definitely off of you know, wells. Um, but I know that he says there's got to be a lot of like, you have to check a lot of boxes before you can say definitely, oh yeah, we've got this. So I don't, I'm not sure. So you indicated that there, they only have three, four, um, I don't know, what do you call a baby Pops. shark? Pops? Okay. Um, so is their reproductive lifespan only about 10 years? No. They start having babies, the females start having babies at 33. They can go up to 70. So you're not talking three or four in a lifetime, you're saying no. three or four in a litter? Yes. Which is about- Three or four that are six feet long in a litter? Yes. Ouch. Yes. <laughs> um, one of the other things that they, they are finding, like you saw the pictures that I had of the data of the, the sharks way out to sea. Those are all female sharks. They think some people, the scientists believe that the female sharks go out to stay away from the males because the males attack them and hold on to them in order to copulate, in order to have reproduction occur. And they are severely damaged by all of that biting. So that the females will go out, this is the, the hypothesis, that the females go out to recover and avoid the males for a period of time, that they're out, you know, far away from where the males would be. So that's a thought some scientists think. So do they have an estrus cycle? I'm not sure. No. I really don't know. <laughs> do they I have to look it up. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> do they know what they're doing for food all the way out there? I mean, to, certainly there's other creatures out there. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's that, I mean, there are other creatures out there. They know that they're, they're, I mean, mola mola are global fish and they are a, a food that white sharks will eat. So there are big fish that are out there, tuna, definitely. Um, there are um, a nice meal for a white shark. But they think, you know, when they, they again, they're in, not in danger, but they're vulnerable. And so they don't really want to catch them and cut them. And, you know, see what they've been eating because they don't want to waste the shark for that purpose. Especially if they're pregnant. Right, right. And having a 16 foot shark, trying to get it, you know, so that you can safely pull it in and it's kind of interesting. Does O-Search have any plans to do work more off of Maine or? They are not looking to Maine because they don't think they're enough to so that's why they're either at Cape Cod, they're up in Nova Scotia. They had a plan, they had an expedition plan for the, sum, uh, the summer back in Nova Scotia to keep the research going there. But their ship broke down on the way, 
so they had to scrap those plans. Um, I believe they're going to go back. Um, one of the primary places that they know white sharks hang out is off the west of Georgia. And they just know that that's a, a conglomeration place that a lot of white sharks go kind of in the off, not summer season, but that's where they are. And so that gives them a lot of data. They can collect the sharks there, tag them there, and then follow them wherever they go in the world. It, it's, they know that they're going to be there, um, and they can tag them, and then they can follow them. But they had hoped to be back in Canada this summer. They also have plants. The Mediterranean Sea has quite a population of white sharks. So they had planned to go into the Mediterranean. Now, if you ever hear about, you know, the French Riviera having white sharks? <laughs> no. <laughs> but evidently they do. And so they were planning, Osage was planning to go to the Mediterranean and do an expedition there, kind of see what the sharks in that part of the world were like. But that was on, that's on their, like, you know, future plans. So you were saying that climate change, as far as we know, is just not playing much part or shifts in the Gulf right. Stream right. or any of that. Nope. So they can just kind of leave yep. that. Yep. I mean, a lot of people, of course, when the fatality occurred, instantly people start to, oh, it's global warming. The white sharks are coming because of global warming. Yeah, you hear that. But when you learn about the biology of white sharks, you recognize that that's really not a case for them. Now, if you're going to talk about all of a sudden I'm going to see some different species of sharks up here, like a great hammerhead, which is known to be a, a, you know, a warm water shark, that would be a concern mm -hmm. of global warming. But that's not what we're, in terms of white sharks, in terms of white sharks, in terms of white sharks they know in terms of global warming and that warming Gulf Stream that species of other fish are here that they've never seen. And that's a result of that global, you know, the warming Gulf, Gulf Stream coming up. But it's not a white shark thing. Do we have other sharks here? I'm like, there are eight sharks? species of there are eight species of sharks in Maine. But none of the others are right are dangerous. Or, right, except for if they jump into a boat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, 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 Just that was wild. <laughs> Um, one of the most prolific sharks here in Maine are the dogfish sharks. And one of my former students um, is a master diver, and she's finishing her advanced degree at Maine Maritime Academy. And she said they're the stupidest fish in the sea. She says that the dogfish just swim into her. She's out there doing her thing. She's getting hit by a dog. You know, it's not like they're attacking her. They just are stupid. <laughs> She talks about the dogfish shark, and there it goes. They're, <laughs> but they're very prolific in Maine. Dogfish shark was a lot of them. Do you know anything about um, sand tiger hybrids that are supposedly in Canada? I have heard that. And uh, they, are, they are kind of like a hybrid that can go into the fresh water. And yes, I know, that's what I know, is that they can go into the fresh water, that they're hypotonic, that their blood chemistry can manage that change in salinity. Um, that's about the extent of what I know. Yeah, but I'm wondering if it was like a one-off or if there are more things Generally, generally if there's one, there's one. Do you get the time? No, no, they're pretty, very, you know, they're very low key. Yeah. They're very, low, they're bottom dwellers. Are, yeah. They're very low key. Regular tiger sharks are very. Right. Regular tiger sharks are bad. Yeah. Or like, I shouldn't say bad. Is it, is bad is shark the sand tiger shark the one you see in the aquarium? Yes. They look very scared. Right, but they're not. But they're not. Right. But this is a sand tiger. Other sharks we have, blue sharks are deep water sharks. They're out far. 
there are there are quite a population of blue sharks in Maine, but they are out, and they you know they're not attacking anybody or anything else. Poor beagles are a smaller shark. Again, they're not attacking anybody unless you're a underwater surveyor with a camera and bright lights. <laughs> they, do, I, I, they do look like white sharks sometimes from afar. They've been very heavily uh, misclassified up in, uh, in England mm -hmm. as white sharks. So, but they, they look like yeah. 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 a little, little smaller. Yes. <laughs> a little like a baby, like a juvenile. <laughs> Are you in the water right now? No. Oh. <laughs> I grew up on the Jersey Shore. I lived in the water as a kid. Lived, lived, lived. And this is one of the things I think, like the whole thing of, of a celebration. When I grew up, I graduated high school in 1977. I, I literally, my house was 100 yards from the ocean. I lived in the water. Never, ever gave a thought to a shark being there. We never saw sharks, we never saw whales, we never saw dolphins, we never saw any of those things. 1972, the Clean Water Act was passed. It actually came because of the Androscoggin River. That was the impetus for the, the 1972 Clean Water Act. And from the Clean Water Act, now in New Jersey, my sister still lives there in New Jersey, whales all the time, dolphins all the time. I mean, animals that, that we would never have imagined when I was growing up all the time. Like you can be sitting on your beach chair looking at, oh yeah, there's a whale reaching out there. The 1972 Clean Water Act, the 1972 Marine Mammal Protection Act has really done marvelous things for the ecosystem of our ocean. Yeah, we've got some global warming and things are changing, but the water's cleaner than it's ever been since, you know, way back when, before industrialization occurred. Um, the water is cleaner now, more species are you know, I, I, I feel for the fishermen because the rules do prohibit their, the, the amount of catch that they can do, but the species are surviving. When I was a kid, they, we called them doormats, big fluke that were the size of doormats. And my husband, who used to fish all the time, said they, they disappear, they're back. And so it's, it's a really, it's a cause for celebration that we've got now you know, the apex predators are coming back, the mammals are coming back, you know, all the mammals, I mean, you know, whales that we hadn't seen before. Um, off the coast of Hakum, the whale was there for like a week, and people were crazy, like they had to get down and see the humpback whale that were there, and they were, they were like putting on a show for people. That's new. It's not something like right there that's been there before. You know, you had to go way out in the ocean to, on a whale watch to see something. Like you lost sight of the shore, so it's really, it's really cool that everything's coming back. And what's really cool too, Maine was an impetus. <laughs> Do you think you'll start seeing the stop of lead kits at yes. state beaches? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm 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 pushing for that personally. The stop of lead, not only because of the shark incidents and everything else, but as a school teacher. I, you know, if there's an incident, that's a, tr a tragic incident, they're not worried about my students who are injured. I'm worried about my students who are injured, and I want to stop the lead kit in my classroom. And so I'm thinking, you know, in Cape Cod, what's really, really cool, um, I spent a couple days down there this summer working with the Atlantic White Shore Conservancy. There's one in every single lifeguard stand, and they leave them there overnight. So that the people are surfing, and they have an incident, where the shark cuts an artery, the stop the bleed kits are right there. Everybody down there, I mean, and you can put your, you have your iPhone, there's a QR code, you click it and it walks you through how to do it. So, you know, if you, even if you know nothing about that and you want to help save somebody's life, that you, you put your cell phone there, QR code, and it walks you through what to do. And I, I know that we're getting there. I don't think it's going to oh, be in good. the next two or three it's years. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's easy to get trained. You know, it's an hour long training. And then just think of, you know, the great things that you can do to save somebody's life. The surfboards, the, um, the ankles, yeah, they're all 
design that and return this. Specifically for that. So they know that the shark incident, the shark attacks, was the 2018 death in Cape Cod, the 2020 death here. They recognize that if those people had been closer to shore, then they had gotten the stuff, the leak kits, that they would not have gotten. The majority of people who are attacked by sharks don't die. They get help soon enough. They might lose a limb or a leg or something. But if you get help soon enough, you don't die. The majority of the people who die is because they bleed out. It's, it's, you know, it takes two minutes to three minutes to bleed out. So by the time something happens here and you're way out and you get in here, it's too late. That's not the It's really a good program. G-I-L-L-S, Gills Club. And it's a program by women shark scientists for girls. And so they have regular podcasts for, for girls all about sharks. And it's scientists who are women who do the presentations. Gills Club. Thanks so much, Sue. This is a really great presentation. Thanks.